Good evening, everyone, and welcome to JW3 Online and to this very special event this evening. I'm Judy Trotter, Head of Adult Education at our wonderful community centre in Swiss Cottage in London. And for the last year, yes, it's almost a year that we've been online and formed an, an amazing online community, uh, which both students, participants and presenters and JW3 are very proud to have started and kept going in such a uh, positive way. Um, well before we became online, I um, had Anna's name given to me as somebody that should be talking about Theresienstadt to us. And for the last two years, we've been planning to do a performance of Brandivar, which I was hoping we would uh, bring Anna in to uh, support the educational program around. Well, that hasn't happened, obviously. So I was really pleased when Francois came to me and said, why don't we do this event together? And here we are, um, so delighted. So Professor Francois Guinet is the Professor of Modern Jewish History in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at University College London. And he's going to be uh, helping curate the evening, keep Anna um, uh, on her questions and uh, chairing the event for me. We are happy to take questions uh, at the end of the event, and that will just be in the Q&A, uh, which you'll see at the bottom or top or side of your screen, depending on what you're watching on. Um, it's different depending on which device it is. Uh, we will obviously keep you muted throughout. Uh, the chat function will not work for you because we need to use that ourselves. And um, I very much want to thank our partners in this, Renata Clark and the Czech Centre, uh, again, somebody I was in touch with many years ago and so pleased to reconnect with and to have the Czech Centre as part of our event this evening. I'm really delighted. So and now with no more ado, I'm going to hand it over to Francois with great thanks um, to all of you. Francois, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and uh, thank you to JW3 for hosting uh, this evening's event. I'm, I'm thrilled and delighted to be able to have a conversation with the author of the volume, The Last Ghetto, An Everyday History of Theresienstadt, Anna Haikova. Anna Haikova is Associate Professor for, content, for Modern Contemporary European, uh, no, for Modern Continental European History at the University of Warwick. She's a internationally acclaimed expert in the history of the Holocaust and the author of this remarkable book. And uh, we have uh, a, a one hour to discuss uh, some uh, of the most salient elements, the most salient characteristics of this remarkable book. Um, perhaps for a starter, Anna, the subtitle says an everyday history of Theresienstadt. Uh, reading this volume, I thought this is so much more. It is a, well, it is an everyday history and we are going to speak about your workshop in the course of the evening, obviously, how you, through a very impressive, painstaking, many year long research uh, have unearthed a, an, an immense variety of source material to reflect what the everyday life in Ghetto Theresienstadt was between November 1941 and April, May 1945. But it is so much more. It is a cultural history. It is social history. It is political history. It is gender history. Um, so so uh, to come to my first question or my first perspective, which I would like to develop with you is one thing you say in the introduction, which I thought was so important to say and to state to think thinking about the Holocaust, thinking about such an exceptional extreme situation that you write, terror does not suspend society. I repeat that, terror does not suspend society. How, how important is this statement for your approach to thinking about the extreme situation of Theresienstadt? Thank you so much. Um, I do want to start with thanks. Um, and I'm delighted to be for the first time at JW3. It's a place that I have long admired and have been very keen to uh, 
uh, be it. But I also want to thank Renata Clark and the Czech Center. I remember Renata, we met pretty much exactly five years ago, and he said, that book, once it's out, come to me. We must do something at the Center, Czech Center. And indeed, Renata, one of my first places that I approached was the uh, Czech Cultural Center and you. So I'm delighted to be here and that we can have such a nice uh, cooperation. Um, when you think about concentration camps, ghettos and other uh, Nazi places of terror and incarceration, one of the most influential thinkers is Hannah Arendt and her origins of totalitarianism. And together with the totalitarian school, um, this very influential way of thought looks at totalitarian regimes as something that destroys the social. And Arendt in her book argues that concentration camp um, and by extension the ghetto is kind of the most extreme where the social crumbles and where um, uh, one person is to another a wolf that solidarity and what it means to be human will fall away. And I was always uh, curious about that. And I know that you and I will be talking also about how did I come to this topic? And that has for me some biographical ties. And I remember as a um, young student, I came to Israel. I met the friends of my grandparents on my paternal side. And they would be sharing these stories about Theresienstadt, what it meant to be a young man or young woman in Theresienstadt, how they played soccer and um, how they organized toilet paper and how they dated and how they were afraid of transports and how they spoke German or lacked speaking German. And I was so uh, fascinated by this abundance of social life in a place where I thought people just kind of suffered because the stories I've heard from my maternal grandmother who was persecuted as a political resistance fighter who survived uh, Ravensbrück and um, Buchenwald uh, satellite camps, talked very much about conflicts, but also about friendships. But I thought one day I would love to have the opportunity to discuss it in detail. And this book was for me that opportunity. And I think one of the reasons why totalitarian school in this respect has been so influential is that um, we tend to find a measure in solace and comfort in othering between them and us, between the terror and our safe homes. Mm. Um, and it makes us feel safer because this is not something that will happen to us. Mm. And it is understandable, but I think if we want to understand how people react to conditions of extreme, we need to understand that they adapt. In fact, the last year has taught us nothing but that. A year ago, none of us would have liked to think about meeting on Zoom. And today it's something that is a highlight of our days and we have come to generally approach um, and uh, appreciate. And I do not want to engage in a banal comparison. I mean, we do not suffer. The worst that happened to us is that we stood in line at Waitrose or at ASDA. Um, but I think it's one of the tasks of Holocaust historians to come to understand what does it tell us about human society and I understand my book as a modest contribution to that question. Mm. I think I think you are much more radical in the book than 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 you make it appear now uh, um, perhaps on purpose so so uh, uh, perhaps I mean it, it is always uh, unpleasant for an author to tell uh, the audience what is in the book so let me briefly describe the book. So the, the first two chapters are really covering what we want to discuss in more detail uh, tonight. Uh, the first chapter is called An Over-Organized Ghetto and is a stunning review of how Theresienstadt was made to function as a, as a, as a, as a, well, as, as one uh, uh, memoir said, autarkic Stadt, as an autarkic city in itself, obviously a delusional understanding of what was going on. Um, but uh, the second chapter is called a, a society based on inequality. And here, the, the, uh, the, the other side of your approach becomes much more transparent and is much more put into relief that, that actually what happened is on this, this organization on the one hand, but on the other hand, the self-reproducing society and what you do in the book on every page, and it is very impressive to read, is that you explain how relationships between people and between groups of people were reacting to the extreme situation, but were also reproducing things, ways of behavior, relationships, ideas, stereotypes, which predate 
the ghetto. So that's these are the first two chapters. Then you look at food, and I have to get up <laughs> to turn on my light. Sorry for that. I have to get up to turn my light on. This is an automatic process in the evening in a university. Anyway, food, food and hunger as, as one of the main lines of, of establishing hierarchies and power and, and suffering. Then the chapter on medicine and illness, uh, where you go in great detail to, to reflect on the quite impressive achievements in the ghetto, but which would also reflect these, these different relations. Then cultural life, probably the thing which most people associate with when, when they hear Theresienstadt, they think Bundibau, they think Verdi's Requiem, they think lectures, they think Leo Beck giving a lecture, which is so dominant in our, uh, uh, in, the, in the shared memory of, of uh, Theresienstadt. And finally, transports to the East, the end of the ghetto. So this is the spectrum you you cover. Uh, and um, so so coming back to the question, what what do you what do you, what I do you achieve in this book is is to show what people the, the, the prisoners in Theresienstadt thought they were doing and what they were really not what they were really doing, but what it what how we can understand what they were doing. Because what you said, and, and perhaps you can can uh, elaborate on that. They were also reproducing very stark forms of inequality. And perhaps you, you would like to expound on that, uh, in, in which way and, and, and where and how, and how this impacted the prisoners. Mm -hmm. Big questions. Um, and it's fascinating to see how closely you have read it and how something that has become for me the oxygen in which I live, and sometimes it's easy for authors to forget what are the arguments you're making because you've been living with them for such a long time to see that unpacked so uh, thoroughly and enthusiastically. Um, class is such an important um, category to analyze uh, concentration camps and ghettos with because we tend to think about uh, the society of victims as already dead and also as powerless and if they have power it's resistance or children mm -hmm or uh, music and theater as far as there is ancient is concerned, spiritual resistance and whatnot. And uh, as any society, there is instead recreated classes. One of the things that I show is how class was expressed was radically different to the pre-war 1930s Berlin or Prague or Vienna. Where before you would be poor if you lived in a tiny apartment without running water and you were super wealthy if you lived in a comfortable villa with a gardener and chauffeur and whatnot. In Theresienstadt, you are very wealthy if you have a tiny, teeny room of your own and you are poor if you are accommodated in an overcrowded attics um, without access to uh, running water or toilet uh, or light. And indeed, that translates for the elderly, also to the mortality. It translates um, what kind of job are you able to get? Are you protected from transports? Um, and what kind of food rations are you going to get? Mm -hmm. And what is so interesting is that what defines class in Theresienstadt is at best only loosely related to how people defined their class belonging before the war. Whether you were a banker or professor, or whether you were a butcher or baker or a stonemason maybe plays a role for the butchers and bakers and stonemasons because they are needed in today's Instadt. Mm. But what is also immensely important is what you would call seniority. Since how long have you been in the ghetto? Because the longer you have been there, the higher your status. The first two transports sent to today's Instadt, the so-called Aufbau Kommando construction detail, are relatively young men from Prague, Czech Jews. And for a long time, they are promised protection by the SS when transports are sent to the East. And because they have arrived first, and because um, they have this certain level of protection that also applies to the um, core families, they become the social elite of Theresienstadt. And together it's also with them, their friends and acquaintances at networks. So over time, you see a growth of Theresienstadt of a social elite of young Czech Jews, largely men, but also women people who have the best access to jobs that are cooks and bakers and butchers, also some engineers and some medical personnel, mm. and people who come later 
and are maybe middle-aged or older, people who have children of their own, usually do not quite make it into the social elite. So in Theresienstadt, you have a number of experiences what it means to be a prisoner here. You have a completely different Theresienstadt if you are an old Viennese lady whose um, children and grandchildren either have emigrated or were sent to um, uh, District Lublin because apart from the former Czechoslovakia, the Nazis sent only exception groups to Theresienstadt. So it's the whole demographics only for the Czech Jews. And whether you are there with your parents and grandparents is quite an important thing whether uh, you went there, uh, whether you were deported there on your own. And yet again, if you are a middle-aged mother of two children for whom you need to provide. Um, now, I should remark about the children that the self-administration set up um, in the first months um, um, well-established system for youth care homes. That is something that is particularly well known for Theresa Chat. It's the Red Cross visit, it's the propaganda movie, it's the culture life, and it's the children. Mm -hmm. So yes, the children will have it somewhat easier and parents who have been subscribed uh, to forced uh, work or for work for the Jewish self-administration do not have to worry about the children, but it's still the parents who will want to see the children once a day, usually it's the mothers, and try to organize something edible for them. So when you look at the memories of those few surviving people who had children in Theresienstadt, who would every evening run after the kids, not very surprisingly, but it's something that not has not really many people have paid attention to, is that these people say, I have really never been to any of the cultural events because I never had time. And also, if I had anything edible or anything barterable to exchange it for, I would not spend it on um, cultural event tickets. I would spend it on something to bring to my children or to my family. Yeah. So with that, you can already start asking questions about the material conditions for everything that is happening in Theresienstadt, how people barter food or yeah. makeup, or clothing or whatever else for conditions to make that is in chat for them somewhat more livable. Mm. So you have the so bu bubble of the social elite that has pretty memories of that is in chat as they themselves said. Uh, you have uh, young men, survivors who said something like the tragedy of my generation is that we have pretty memories of that is in chat and the bubble kind of ends when they arrive to Auschwitz. But in a way it also does not burst because even though Auschwitz and everything afterwards is terrible, Theresienstadt lives on in these memories. Yeah. And it's the, it's the narratives of the social elite that for us has largely come to shape how we see Theresienstadt. And that's one of the things that I endeavor to do is to show that this is not the only story. It's one of the stories. And I wish people will read my book and see these layers alongside each other mm. and put them in connection with each other. I mean, one of the, one, uh, I mentioned that already, I, one of the, uh, I mean, there are many, many strong sides to this book. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating and very important study. Uh, but uh, what, what um, struck me is how plausible you make the emergence of this, what you call the social elite uh, of young Czech Jews, female and male, Although obviously this uh, this social elite was in itself already uh, structured, uh, and and what I think is important to uh, elaborate about is is that this social elite was not only there because it was there early, but also because it was able to use this status uh, in order to well to consolidate this position uh, by by establishing very firm control over the many agencies in the ghetto. Before we come to that, I think I would like to show two, I printed two pages from your book, uh, because I, I only had the PDF. Uh, so, so this is the German control system over Theresienstadt, and you can't read, unfortunately, this, but this is, this is one, one, uh, one chart in your book where you explain how the command structure functioned from Berlin to, to the Auswanderungsstelle in Prague and from there to Theresienstadt and to the ESS and the German functionaries who, and this is, you describe this in, in, with great plausibility and great precision, who were practically not there. They were practically invisible. I mean, you had very few visits of the, uh, of the SS headquarters nearby Theresienstadt. So that's, that's the Germans who take, keep control from afar at arm's length, literally. 
And this is the self-administration in the ghetto. At some point, you explain that the description of the administration of the ghetto went for 37 pages, uh, 47 uh, major departments and sub-departments. So it was a so the 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 Aufbau Commando, which establishes the the functioning elite in in the ghetto, is is able to establish a very complex a very complex system of administration and functions and roles, which actually is, is, is even striking the Germans as being perhaps too comprehensive a control. And at some point, I believe in 1943, they, they force Austrian and German Jews as becoming co-heads of these many, many departments. So there is a social elite, but it is it it stays in the lead because it has a very good grip on everything. And and I think uh, yeah, it, it would be really good if you could elaborate on that how how this worked on the everyday basis. I mean, how this power structure was reiterated, mm -hmm. how it was made possible and and mm -hmm. continue to function until until the uh, the destruction of the ghetto in the fall of 1944. Mm -hmm. Uh, Francois, um, before I go there, two things um, so that people who have not read the book will uh, maybe feel that they are not, uh, that they also understand where this is coming from. So Jewish councils and the Judenräte are, are a topic that has attracted a lot of uh, fascination, but also lots of scorn. And my thinking about the Jewish functionaries has been shaped um, by debate by people coming like Doran Rabinovich, Beate Maya, and Dan Diner, who said it's pointless to spend our time blaming Jewish functionaries for collaboration with the Germans. What is much more relevant to, is to ask, why did these people do that? Mm. What did they believe can they actually improve? What was their leeway? Why were they hated so much? And how did they understand their social position? That's, I guess, the discourse in which I positioned my work. Mm. And it is the contrast between the first elder, Jakob Edelstein, who was a Czech Zionist, the second elder, Paul Epstein, the former head of the Reich Association of German Jews, who was a German Zionist, but was never really seen as a Zionist uh, by the Czech social elite because he was not Czech, because you can see how it becomes coded, who is real Zionist and how the coding as a Zionist or whatever else really depends from a social setting to a social setting. Mm -hmm. And the last elder, Benjamin Mumoshtan from Vienna, who did a grave mistake of surviving, which people never forgave him, and he was uh, arrested briefly after liberation, um, apparently also with some support of Leo Beck um, as a presumed collaborator and spent a year and a half in custody. And then he was acquitted. Um, and I show the stories of these three men, how they understood their position, their leadership style, how they decided things, how they operated with social capital and how they worked in order to contribute from my point of view how did this impossible position look like? Because in Theresienstadt, like in other ghettos, or in like most other ghettos, the Nazis forced the Jews to put together the actual transport lists. Mm. And one thing that is that we really need to forefront is there is this is an impossible job. There is no good way to put together a transport list of people who are going to be sent to Auschwitz. Now in Theresienstadt, fell along almost until the liberation, mm. people were able to refuse the knowledge that kept coming in over and over where these people are going and what is going to happen to them. And they believed that they are able to put these transport lists in a human way, that they will deport families together. So they are not completely heartbroken because the partners or the children stay behind. And in fact, I was able to find some of the surviving testimonials, the Ausreihungsanträge, the petitions to be taken out of transport and where you see how desperate are people when their children stay behind or where their parents are deported without them. And they plea to the self-administration to be deported with them because when people are going on their last trip, which they rightly fear that it will be deadly, one of the really defining things for them is, am I allowed to go on this last trip with my family? Mm. And to recognize these decisions and these bonds as something that is defining and that is a form of agency 
It's one of the things that I was very excited, but also profoundly moved to be able to analyze and to write about. Mm. So with the self-administration, they very much believed that they are shaping the conditions for the better. And in fact, for them, bureaucracy became a way of agency. But how they implemented bureaucracy, in a way, they very much believed that in the eye of the Holocaust, they get the news what is happening in Poland and the Netherlands and France as people are deported from around the world. Some people listen uh, to illegal uh, radio and get in the news. And because the raising chat continues to stand and it's actually never closed. Yes, you have destructive transports in fall 44, but unlike Vuc or other ghettos, the raising chat is never completely liquidated. It is the last ghettos to stand. In fact, it was liberated one day after armistice, which is why I titled the book, The Last Ghetto. Mm. Um, and the Jewish self-administration kind of continues to stand on in this belief that they are making the raising chat an island in the middle of the horrors where people will be able to survive. Now, this is a belief, this is a narrative, and they hold on to it until the very end. And you as a Polish historian know what comes at the end. At the end come death marches from everywhere, from Bergen Belsen, from Mauthausen, with people dying and dead of typhus and horrible diseases, um, close trains on which uh, people have started committing cannibalism. And these people who often come from some Majdanek or uh, Auschwitz or Bergen Belsen come bearing the news over and over and over to the Theresienstädters and among them are people who have survived the Warsaw Ghetto and they've survived I guess one would call with this phrase unspeakable things mm -hmm. they arrive to Theresienstädter and they see children and of course in Polish ghettos in Łódź and uh, Warsaw and elsewhere children are often among the first groups uh, that are to be murdered and for them Theresienstadt is banal it's nothing and what I want to show with this story, and this is why it was important for me in the research to also go to Warsaw, to the Zich, and to read through the Yiddish and Polish testimonies, not that there is is banal, it is not, but how the many Jewish experiences and perspectives during the Holocaust could differ, but also sometimes intersect. Hmm. This, I mean, this obviously all, all makes sense. The, what I think is important is that what we what we see in Theresienstadt is is uh, I mean especially in the in the personality of these three elders uh, Edelstein, Epstein, and Morgenstein is that there are different ideas about what Theresienstadt is and should be and what may be its task. So and and this is and I, I really I go back to the question of 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 the uh, the the society which which pr reproduces inequality. Uh, the 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 first elder Edelstein, uh, 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 an Arden Zionist, and uh, has has an idea of Theresienstadt as proving the worthiness of the Jews, and the the, the this is discussed with with great precision and and detail on on the level of everyday engagement and and so on. One of the consequences, and this is really an important point, which which struck me again, I mean, I knew it, but it struck me much, so much more false reading your book, that this uh, master narrative, you call it that, it's a master narrative of, of Jews making this ghetto a, a success story, despite everything, because this is what we can, reproduce or pr produces an in inequality, which is, if you look at it, actually, very difficult to apprehend, uh, especially looking at the, uh, I mean, on the one hand, you have this very elaborate youth support system. And on the other, you have this vast, these vast numbers of elderly people from Austria and, and, and Germany who are just left to die. So they are left to die in the in not because it, it, the for example Edelstein was evil, but obviously because the overall framework was a, inhumane and terrorist and and part of the German uh, dis uh, idea of destruction. But how this was translated in the ghetto was this nar nar master narrative of forcefulness, success, where the elderly didn't have a place, and and there are so many examples in your book. Where, where this is expressed, I mean, the typhoid crisis of 1933, where, where the doctors are worried that 12 children die 
uh, and 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 even I mean you you put this very very in very clear uh, words. I, I, I'm not really worried about the fact that six thousand elderly prisoners die in the same crisis because they are not part of the success story. They are they are yeah they they are they are not expendable but they the, the focus is somewhere else and this is i mean obviously we understand the broader framework of 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 what this how this was was brought brought about but it is still uh tough reading it is a holocaust book francois and like you said i the book is not here to say that somebody was evil Everybody was a victim. Nobody deserved to die. Yeah. Not Jakob Edelstein, not Zuzana Ružičková, who should have not been sent to Theresienstadt and should have not been sent to Auschwitz and to Neuengamme and to Bergen-Belsen. And I am thrilled that uh, her cousin is today uh, here with us. And uh, not the Jewish informers who mm. volunteered to denounce for the Germans so that the SS could run the ghetto without really taking too much part in the organization. Mm. Now with the mass narrative, what is interesting um, about it is how it creates Theresienstadt into one whole, but this one whole is not really linked to equality and it's not linked to Jewishness. Everybody who is sent to Theresienstadt is because they are racially nominally Jewish. Um, they are Jewish according to the uh, racist Nuremberg laws. Many of the people are atheists, some of them are lapsed Jews, some of them are reformed Jews, some of them are Orthodox Jews, some of them are Christians. Actually, some of the most ardent uh, services that take place in Theresienstadt are the Protestant and Catholic services. And I insist for a more heterogeneous, more inclusive Jewish history in which we come to understand that the Catholic services in Theresienstadt and the people who are happy that they can take hostium is part of Jewish history too. It mm. is this classical non-Jewish Jewish history as Isaac Deutsche has called it. Mm. So what creates the one whole in Theresienstadt is the mass narrative of making something good out of something bad. Mm. Making Theresienstadt a place where Jews kind of who have become pariahs and who have been expelled and who have to wear this horrible yellow flag can show that they, with manual labor, people who always worked as attorneys or intellectuals, can actually make something good out of it. And they can take care, and now the narrative goes, of the weakest, of the children, not of the elderly. And the interesting thing here is, even the elderly sign up to the narrative. As I went for years and years to the archives and read testimonies, early and late, diaries and letters, and memoirs and all histories over and over, I heard versions of the same story. Mm. Um, and the kind of flip side of it is, like you said, the elderly have the highest mortality of people in Theresienstadt. From the 34,000 people who die in Theresienstadt, some 90% of them are people over 60 years of age. And we'll come to the why the 60 is so important here. And um, the elderly have hands down the highest probability to die to interest in shit. If you are under 60, the probability drops to something like 10% and less. If you are 45, it drops to 2%. Mm. So younger people up to 60, unless they are deported to the East, they are probable to die, to survive the in They will be bugged by bed bugs. They will have enteritis. They will be hungry. They will be terribly worried, but they will probably survive. People over 60 years of age, their fate is basically sealed with the Jewish self-administration under Jakob Edelstein, who in May 42 learns from the Germans that people from Austria and Germany will be deported to Theresienstadt, but not all of them, only the elderly. And they decide on a triage of the food rations, on basically three main food rations between the non-workers, normal laborers, and hard workers. The hard workers are people as butchers and bakers and whatnot. Normal workers are pretty much the big pool of people in today's shop. And people who no longer work, either because they are sick or because they are elderly, get to non-work rations that are not only hands down the smallest, and there is quite a big difference in calories, but the food that they are fed is also the least heterogeneous. It's almost only carbohydrates and fats, mm. which means that when you kind of become sick, be it with enteritis or something else, 
And this is the moment when I met with uh, nutritionists and doctors and discussed this all this in detail and could live all my kind of nerdy moments. But it's really important to understand how malnutrition works. People do not actually die of hunger. They die because the immunity system after some hundred days of starvation stops working because of the avitaminosis. This is why the food rations and what is in them is so important. But this is not all of the story. Another heartbreaking aspect of that is that um, the social elite of the ghetto, people like the cooks and the butchers would sometimes remove parts of the food to help their friends. Say, if somebody went to play soccer, they had a friend who would work in the kitchen and give them some of the food. And the easiest food that you could uh, take some from, basically to steal, was from the non work rations. Mm. So at one point, the head of the ghetto police, Karl Löwenstein, went to the pathology and saw that all of these corpses of elderly, and he said it was just skin and bones. And when you lifted them, they did not weigh more than a corpse of, of a child. They weighed maybe 30 kilo. And I have read the diaries of the elderly who write and write and stop and stop and go on the scale and say, I would not believe that I could weigh 35 kilo. Mm. And it, it is not that they were so tiny, even though they were not as tall as we maybe grow today. They just have grown so thin and they continued recording it. And the head pathologist said to Levenstein, but this is completely normal. This is the dead with whom that, that are here every day that I, 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 um, uh, uh, that I receive as the health pathologist. Mm. And it is not only the Austrian and the German elderly who have such a skyrocketing mortality. I had access to the internal citizenship database. My father is a sociologist with his help. I was able to run a quantitative analysis and the mortality of the Czech elderly is the same like that for the German and Austrian that means that the Czech elderly, whose children and grandchildren were with them in the ghetto, who were often these cooks and bakers, that the solidarity did not move beyond two generations. And then when you cross check it with qualitative testimonies, with the diaries and letters and memoirs of the young people of the social elite, you will find that in a little mention, grandmother died early after she arrived to Theresienstadt. You have some exceptions, and this is always the people who either um, had um, Gentile relatives outside who sent them parcels or the elderly who were um, house elders and therefore had access to better food. Or it was the elderly who had relatives in Theresienstadt who supported them in food terms, especially for the elderly, but pretty much everybody for Theresienstadt. I can say survival, how they live, to what do they have access, nothing of that is an accident. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the, the uh, I'm, I'm I'm mindful of the time and and think of what we want to cover in in uh, the allotted hour. Um, let me let me mention here something about your workshop. I mean, you you put a lot of emphasis on diaries and and um, one. I mean, the the the, the bibliographical apparatus of this book is very very impressive. Uh, it it is a lot of very very hard painstaking research which has gone into this volume. I, I should emphasize that. Uh, question: How many diaries have you looked at? And 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 uh, I mean approximately. And and uh, obviously this is a very conscious choice because a diary is obviously not a post factum reflection of how I want to see what I suffered in this period of time, but it is a description of the things as they develop. And there's, there are very few places uh, in, the, in the German uh, camp terror system where we have such a dense, uh, dense documentation. So, so share some insights into, into these diaries, please. Oh, this question opens for me about five doors that I will go into each of the doors very quickly. First, I'm delighted that you think that I did a good historiographic job. I actually feel completely terrified because my editor at OUP was very strict and cut a lot of my footnotes. So I'm terrified that friends and colleagues will read the book and not see themselves cited and will hate me. So please don't hate me. I don't want to. I'm, I'm not a historian of the Holocaust. So I know, I but other people who may be listening today. Uh, 
Second, I was profoundly influenced when I started with my research with the beautiful book of Alexandra Garbarini about Holocaust diaries. And um, her cultural history of Jewish experience in the Holocaust influenced me both methodologically, but also theoretically. But I also endeavored with the book to go beyond the beaten uh, path of what sources are we going to use. And mm -hmm. I decided early on to see all of the sources as many as possible. So yes, I've worked with something like 150 diaries. I think it from the top of my head, I would have to look at my database. Um, but I looked at early testimonies and at late testimonies. I looked at testimonies by young people and by elderly. I looked at published memoirs. I looked at things in Czech and German and Slovak and Dutch and Danish and Polish and even Hebrew, which I don't understand, but I had a friend who was also doing something on Theresienstadt. We spent long time on Skype translating something from Czech to English and from Hebrew to English. And with that, I had a step at systematic analysis of contrasting the many, many narratives together and to create a more whole and more inclusive picture. Hmm. The, 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 what I find, I mean, the, the, this aspect of, of describing the everyday and, and developing story in, in the in the diaries, I think this is really what what sets this this type of sources apart, isn't it? Um, I have a question. I mean, the, the vast majority of, of the prisoners were Austrian, German and Czech Jews. Um, all three communities at this moment in time I mean, until the, the Nazis came to power, uh, comparatively well integrated, uh, comparatively um, ha having a growing distance to religious practice and observance. Um, you say in, in your book that, that there were three ways to identify as a Jew. Uh, in, uh, one way is to feel pride. I mean, in, in accordance to the master narrative of the achievements of of the inmates then people for example from the from the left wing uh, resistance who were also incarcerated or imprisoned in in Theresienstadt that that all these these people didn't really belong together i think the you gave you quote a couple of very very insightful uh, um, prisoners for that and and shame uh, uh, as as a uh, if you want a reproduction of of the of the stereotypes and the persecution which impacts on on how people perceive themselves, um, it is a question in the chat which I take up on this occasion. What about? I mean, was religion completely absent? I mean, Leo Beck became a very important public intellectual in the ghetto. What about what about religious practice? What about the notion of? Uh, what holidays were celebrated, for example. I mean, that's for the everyday life of the ghetto, probably very important. Hmm. Francois, you forgot my favorite group among the, what does it mean in Theresienstadt about being Jewish, which is the question that people pose themselves over and over. And I was delighted that they do that. And the first group said, it means to be human. Hmm. You know, you have Rudolf Berman, who at some point says, um, when people in Theresienstadt did this, and I say people, not Jews, because we were people. Mm, mm. And they noticed the many, many differences and understood that Jewishness is a social construction. And this mm. is what they took away from it. And I found it a very profound, but also very moving insight. And I, that I, I guess this is what, uh, what was my insight from it all uh, too. Um, maybe I can now start with a small disclosure, I come from a very atheist household in that sense, we are also very Czech. So for me, um, addressing religion was something that got me a little bit out of my comfort zone, which is why I was fascinated when I came across the Protestant and the Catholic group and uh, was drawn to uh, the circle because they left behind such lively testimonies, but because they were also the only groups in Theresienstadt that managed to be deliberately, but also functionally transnational. Mm -hmm. That they went beyond the Czech, German and whatever language border and um, included various groups, whereas the Jewish religious groups that did operate and you do have um, Orthodox and you do have 
observant people, even if they are reform or whatever else, who go every Saturday um, uh, to the services. But these services are largely regional. So the Pilsen Jews go to the Pilsen Rabbi, the Berlin Jews go to the Berlin Rabbi, the Hamburg Jews, and so on. Sometimes they go to something else to check it out, uh, but this is pretty much where it stays. Mm -hmm. Largely, you can also observe in Theresienstadt how various backgrounds shape how religion is lived culturally. Say, German Jews go much more to services uh, than Czech Jews, and for Czech Jews, they are too Jewish, and they are too from, they are too observant. And for the, again, the Czech Jews, uh, for the German Jews, the Czech Jews are too assimilated and they don't really think about it. Um, recently, it was just a Purim holiday and I uh, shared this beautiful uh, poem um, uh, from uh, Theresienstadt about how, oh, this, this story from Theresienstadt from the diary of Willy Mahler, how Purim comes up and uh, his flatmates, uh, his roommates are debating what is actually Purim and nobody can actually understand how it came about and they mix it up all uh, together. But rather than saying that this is a funny story about strange guys, it's a story about what it meant to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And because Theresienstadt is one of the last points where we can read a social and cultural history of these people, I wanted to invite people to think very closely about Theresienstadt because it's one of the last moments when we can take um, the, uh, the, the blood of, of the people who soon afterwards will be murdered to understand who mm -hmm. they were and the class belonged, the, 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 the habitus and the culture they came mm -hmm. from. Mm. I mean, the the I mean, coming from Polish Jewish history, I obviously picked up on on the on those quotes where where I mean, we have I mean, German Jews, Austrian Jews, Czech Jews, so not that many Polish Jews. Although obviously both Momerstein and Edelstein had Galician, which means Polish, deeper roots, uh, as as many others. In fact, if I can share. I, right. I have a story. I, I remember um, at some point I sent some work to a proofreader um, and there was the story how somebody smuggled in bacon to Theresienstadt and the copy editor said this surely must be a typo but it was not a typo it was a statement about uh, who the Czech Jews were. Yeah yeah. Sorry uh, for interrupting. No, no, no worries. Uh, you, 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 you quote uh, Arnold Klein Mm -hmm. uh, who 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 expresses himself in the following way about the Eastern Jews? I mean, that's also. I mean, perhaps you can tell us what what this in the in in Czech was used. I mean, Shodni or something like that. Uh, Eastern Jews. So I quote: Eastern Jews, of course, so pious and orthodox. They make people who are dying promise incredible sums against daily praying of the Kaddish for them for up to 11 months after their passing. Whether the prayers for the dead are even offered is more than questionable. So here, religion becomes part of this process of differentiation and, and saying, well, these are those, but we are very different. Uh, and and, and uh, so in, 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 uh, in uh, in, in this in this chapter, you you refine uh, re, you refer to the way actually these Eastern European Jews, uh, of which we, with whom we have nothing to do, obviously, or obviously the grandmother or grandfather probably was from uh, Lublin or Otvorsk or, or, or whatever. Uh, okay, no, um, were were described as as weak, effeminate. Uh, um, shady and so on so this is a very strong dimension I've, i i i mean obviously i picked up on that uh you don't have to comment on no, that it, it is important to talk about no Czech jews and we are all related to each other because everybody comes from the same some 50 families uh in 18th century so the um yes you do have uh eastern european immigration to uh Czech jewish um genealogy, but really most of these families come from the same 17th, 18th century uh, people. And actually, I would like to know more, and I kind of never looked into it. But if you're interested in Jewish genealogy, which I have to admit is a grand hobby of mine, um, you really see the families going well into the uh, 18th century. Sure. So, and, no, no, and then, I, I was rather thinking of the Austrian and German Jews. Yeah, the Austrian Jews. Um, Arnoscht. Uh, Klein wrote his diary first in Czech and at the point when he comes to this um, diatribe about the poor Eastern Jews, uh, he actually switched into German. So he writes about a student. Okay. But 
thinking about Eastern Jews was for me a really important tool to understand how Jewishness is never a unifying category in Theresienstadt, how it is a divider, and how it's also a measure for people to create their own group and to see the others as Jewish, not in the correct way. Mm. And I think um, it's time for us in Jewish studies to make place for some of the less comfortable uh, insights um, beyond the redemptive narrative, what it means to be Jewish, but also to embrace study of the Holocaust and of the victim society of the Holocaust, what we can uh, learn there about the last moments of these people thinking about what it means to be Jewish, did they come to face in the concentration camps and the ghettos? Um, yeah, I think I, I would like to follow up on that in, in, in uh, once again, praising your book. Because uh, what you do is to, you describe all of that and you, there are some hard truths in your book. Um, some things which are not pleasant to read uh, obviously, the whole topic is not pleasant, uh, but but uh, one thing about your voice as a historian is that you you go at so incredible length to understand where people come from and why they, for example, think in these categories and and what is their rationale. So you you really offer. A way into the, the 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 terrible logic of the place, uh, and and you do so, embracing all of these people in your in your uh, in your historical in your historical in your gaze as a historian, and and this is a great achievement because obviously this is such a such a difficult story uh, to tell, and and I think this is really a remarkable achievement. Uh, you you have you have completed here. Um, yes, I, I think th I wanted to say that uh, because it's 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 such a rich it's such a rich uh, study which which offers us so much so much to understand what 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 was going on uh, in this in this very difficult uh, in these very difficult circumstances in humane circumstances. Um, it is six or seven to eight. Uh, so uh, I think we should perhaps not open up the floor entirely, but we should take a couple of questions. Judy, will you will you help us with that? Yes, for sure. Um, uh, one of the questions that, that uh, Ruth Finkels asked um, along the lines that Francois mentioned before was, is um, who organized uh, the religious services that did take place in Prague? Obviously not in the same way we would talk about now, but do you know who, who was organizing this? Yes, uh, a sub part of the Office of the Jewish Elder of the Kultuswesen was responsible for it. And by 43, the Christians were able to have their own subunit in the self-administration. And then Benjamin Monmustein, because he was um, in, in his civilian life before he was forced to work for the Nazis as a Jewish functionary, because he used to be a rabbi, then put it under his office. So you have also some changes in that 40 page um, organizational scheme. Um, it also is a very lively and um, uh, body that continues developing. Thank you. Um, John W. asks um, what publicity your book, book has received in Prague itself? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's actually, I'm very grateful. Um, it has been reviewed well. Um, last week there was an interview with me in the Czech Weekly for Intellectuals called Respect. Um, I understand there are two reviews coming out and I'm delighted that last week the Czech publishing house Kalich, which is a lovely and very smart and distinguished publishing house um, has bought the rights. I think I have seen my publisher here. So I'm really delighted that uh, my family and um, their friends will be able to read the book in Czech. Lovely, thank you. And, and Anna, what's next for you? <laughs> Um, I'm working on two projects. One is on a um, century European history of communism of people born between 1910-1920 who uh, became political in the 1930s and uh, spent the war often in resistance or as Spanish interbrigadists uh, or in emigration in England. And if they survived the war, they set out to build socialism. So it's basically the generation of mid-ranks in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany. 
Um, and my other project that is perhaps a little bit better known is a history of the queer uh, desire in the Holocaust, same-sex desire in the Holocaust. And I've been writing on a study of an enforced relationship between a woman guard and Jewish prisoner in a satellite camp of Neuengamme. Thank you. And um, the final question we'll take is um, um, asking about the medical profession. Um, a lot of the, the questions have included personal information, which I haven't shared with everyone, um, but he, he felt that his grandfather was a doctor and not considered important as a doctor. Was that the norm, that uh, the medical profession was not considered to be anything uh, that would be treated differently? I, I would, but... That's very unusual, especially younger doctors were able to get jobs as doctors and had this very strong uh, work ethic and also sense of belonging. Um, together with my dear friend and colleague, Mike Beckerman, we have written, I think two months ago, a piece for Los Angeles Review of Books about um, treating epidemics in Theresienstadt and how it relates to the health crisis today. So if you're interested, I would invite you to Google that and uh, read the essay or to read the a chapter on medicine in the ghetto. Of course, many people's experiences are different, but uh, largely uh, people under the age of 50 or 60 who were doctors uh, were able to work as physicians in Theresienstadt. Thank you. Um, so a lot of the uh, questions have also included um, questions about the book itself. And, um, and that's, I apologize that it's been one of those weeks that I haven't, um, prepared it. So normally I would have, I could have sent it out with the email today. So what we'll do is we'll send it out tomorrow um, to everyone that's attending, but just so that you can see the information here. Um, that's the website and it's uh, produced by um, Oxford University Press. And I think Anna can actually get you a discount, which I did not find <laughs> on my emails. Okay, should I show the discount code um yeah if you've got it yes and if not okay. then as i said we could we could send it out tomorrow but yes. okay wait there we go here you go so when you go to the oup website and put in this code you will save 30 percent which means for the hard copy, something like seven pounds and for the ebook, something less. Uh, the book is currently out of stock in UK, which means that too many of you bought it, which is delightful and thank you. Uh, but if you pre-order it, it will come in a month or so. And it costs something like 23 pounds. So this is the- I, I, Can you, I don't see the- The, the, the actual the, code. The code, the-, the um... Here? It's- should be here. No, we've got the list and it says there is a code, but I think you need to open up the, the where it says book code. Uh, I did open it. Ah, okay. It's not it's not showing for us for some reason. Okay. Maybe just send it to me and I'll- I will send it to you and you can circulate it. Lovely, thank you. So, so thank you so much. Um, what an amazing conversation and what amazing information. So, Francois, thank you so much for um, having done all that research and reading the book so carefully and preparing so well. And Anna, thank you so much for having researched and written the book in the first place and yeah. now in sharing the information with us in, in such a a uh, lovely hour that we've had with you and um, I'm sure people will be buying and reading the book. So um, thank you all for coming and it's very strange on a webinar never to see the audience faces when you're uh, used to having Zoom meetings and seeing each other so I have missed seeing you um, but it's been nice having your list and your questions and uh, some of that information I will uh, pass on to Anna uh, in case she is interested and thank you all for coming. I wish you all a pleasant evening and a good weekend. And a thank you again to Renata from the and the and the Czech Center, uh, to Anna and to Francois. Uh, bonsoir. Thank bonsoir. you. Thank Look you. forward to seeing you at JW3 soon.